Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Claire, and I'm here with Megan. Uh, we are the two Masters of Arts candidates for the Socially Engaged Art Program here at Moore College of Art and Design. Um, thank you so much for joining again, um, for being active and engaged listeners. Um, there's just a couple of things we wanted to touch on before we begin our conversation today. Um, first, this meeting is recorded, just so everyone is aware. Um, if you would keep your mics off um, in the duration of the time, we would really appreciate that, just to keep down on feedback and noise. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, um, either to everyone, or if you wanted to private message Anna Drozdowski or Claire Eady, please feel free to do that, and we'll keep an eye on it during our talk today. Um, I uh, will turn it over to Megan here so she can introduce a little bit about herself. Great. Yeah, so my name is Megan Gillardi. I'm one of the MA candidates here at Moore in the Socially Engaged Art Program. I'm originally from here, the greater Philadelphia area, and I earned my undergraduate degree in growth and structure of cities from Bryn Mawr College. I'm interested in research uh, regarding support for individual artists in a place, and more specifically, the role of artists run spaces and grassroots arts organizations in providing support for artists in Philadelphia. So that is what my research is about. And Claire, you would like to yes. introduce yourself? Um, hello again, my name is Claire. Um, I'm originally from Des Moines, Iowa, and I received my undergraduate degree in history from Grinnell College. Um, I focused a lot on uh, the process of colonization and how it affects um, pretty much every social construct, including education and art. Um, that was kind of my basis for beginning my research here at Moore, which is now focused on um, how rural places became rural and what that means for doing art in them, um, especially when it comes to drawing artists and like bringing people into these spaces. Um, today, we are joined by the three members of Impractical Spaces. Um, Corey, Dulce, and Patty. Um, and Practical Spaces is a collaborative national project, and it's going to be a groundbreaking anthology of publications um, that offers a historical look at defunct and active artist-run projects throughout the United States. Um, this is a long-term project, and it will engage at least 50 cities um, with the intent of assembling a compilation of publications for distribution. Um, probably in the form of a book, which kind of charts the national significance of the artist run scene. Um, it's one of the first projects or the first project to ever comprehensively record the de development of artist run spaces on a national scale. Um, and we are really, really thrilled that they are joining with us today. Um, and with, uh, with that said, I will um, turn it over to the three of you if you want to introduce yourself a little bit more. Sure, I'm happy to introduce <laughs> myself. Thank you, uh, Megan and Claire, for inviting us to be here. And um, I know that we're spotlighted, but the view that I have on my screen is a bunch of little boxes. So I hate talking to names. So if you feel comfortable coming off of uh, turning your camera on, please do. We want this to be a conversation and I'd love to see your faces. So I understand if you don't want to turn your camera on, I get it. I've been in Zoom meetings back to back for the last year. So um, no pressure, but I invite you to do that if you want to. Um, so my name is Corey Emig. I am um, based in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm a practicing artist myself. And in conjunction with my practice, which is mainly large scale uh, sculptural installations, I've also had a long running interest in artist run spaces. So in 2011, so I guess that's 10 years ago, I worked with four other artists and we founded a space called Plug Projects in Kansas City, um, which uh, we might talk more about, but it's a crazy space that was founded by five of us. And after four years, um, the, we kind of all went on to do different things and a new group of artists came in to run it. And I think uh, now it's still going and there are members that are running it that I don't even know. So I think it's on like iteration of like number four of groups of people that have run the space. But 
Uh, that space was founded with the interest of bringing artists uh, from outside of Kansas City to Kansas City to show their work and engage in our community, and then to do the opposite of that, to help artists um, have opportunities outside of Kansas City. And uh, Megan, as you're talking about finding uh, support for individual artists, um, that's one of my most uh, recent jobs, which I just, I'm just going through a job change. Um, but I was recently working at Mid-America Arts Alliance where I got to work with um, some really huge foundations like the Mellon Foundation and the Walton Family Foundation to provide um, grant opportunities for individual artists. So that is really close to me as well. And that's me. Dulcie? <laughs> yeah, I can I can go next here. Um, hi, everybody. It's nice to see you all. I'm Dulcie. Um, I, too, am a studio artist and then also do several different kinds of organizational projects akin to kind of what Corey is mentioning in some ways. Um, as far as my studio work that I do, I have been for, for the last few years making work that's really kind of coming out of um, being embedded in farm communities. So working at various, um, I worked at a goat farm, worked at a vegetable farm, um, and making work out of that experience, working with other folks, um, doing, doing work while I'm at work, um, conflating those two, two kinds of uh, practices for myself. Um, and so that's what I kind of focus on that, that results in performative work, sculptural work, video work, all kinds of different formats, um, but really thinking critically about um, the Midwestern landscape um, and then agricultural labor and food as it relates to that landscape. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk with you all um, about rural, to a degree, rural places and rural culture today. Um, in terms of my interest in artist-run spaces, um, I have been involved in Grand Rapids, Michigan uh, many years ago, doing artist-run kind of activity, volunteering, being involved in the scene there, um, then went away. I actually worked at Oxbow School of Art for several years, um, eight years, in fact, um, in Saugatuck, Michigan. Um, as part of that artist community, and then um, I'm now back actually as a visiting faculty member at Grand Valley State University in Grand Rapids, um, and so I have gotten back into that that artist run scene here, um, which has really changed in a lot of ways since since when I was here earlier. Um, so that's that's a little bit about about myself. Um, and thanks, Claire and Megan, for for inviting me. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. So my name is Patty Johnson, and Unlike uh, my two partners, I am not a practicing artist, but I did go to art school. Um, and that was back in uh, 2001, so quite some time ago. And I think that that really primed the way that I think about things and the way that I approach projects. So I am probably best known for my blog, Art F City, which ran from 2005 to about 2018. We still do periodic updates and I run a podcast with the artist William Pohida that deals with the intersection of art, money, and politics. Um, throughout my career, I have engaged with artists and artist-run spaces, and I have made it a practice to try and support artists um, through helping them ga gain exposure via, uh, first via the blog, via um, certain artist projects that we ran we, um, on, Artist City, we ran a very uh, well-known project called the Image Management, where we published uh, images that artists were collecting. This was sort of prior to Tumblr, Instagram, all these other social media sites where people can share whatever the hell they want, whenever they want. Um, and I now run Workshop, which offers high-level professional training to artists. So that's what I do in my day job. And um, what we do together is in practical spaces. And that is a long um, a writing practice that I think, and, well, documentation practice that for me ties into my long, uh, sort of my long writing practice, but um, is really invested in documenting and recording these spaces that we think are so important. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I know Megan and I were talking earlier about um, kind of some questions we wanted to address and what Patty was speaking about there at the end, kind of creating a like a living testament or an archive to um, 
support of artists in the form of like artist run spaces. Um, it's just so incredibly important. Um, and we were curious about kind of like what drew you specifically into the practices that you do together. Um, yeah, like supporting supporting artists, but is what was the kind of pivotal moment for you where you realized that there was a chance to kind of make this comprehensive project that will maybe launch what we're talking about more into the limelight? Well, we, we all, there's kind of, I feel like a lead up to that answer to that question a little bit. Um, we all, we all three met actually um, a few years ago when Corey and I were putting together a symposium as a three day symposium called Beyond Alternatives, which was focused out of our work, um, Corey and my work specifically um, in central Illinois. We started a temporary residency there called Say Uncle. Um, and we realized through doing that kind of hosting artists doing that residency um, that there was a whole lot of things going on. There were a lot of artists run spaces in that area. Um, that area meaning like a three hour, two and a half hour, three hour radius um, from where we were located in central Illinois. Um, and so Beyond Alternatives was a response that Corey and I um, had to bringing, just wanting to bring those folks together um, to have conversations about that, that specific um, kind of structure in a way that's very different than um, the, sometimes the density that can be in, in cities in terms of art, more artist run spaces, 10, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour away from each other. So that, that structure we were interested in um, kind of thinking about in conversation with other people. Um, and we actually invited Patty to be the keynote speaker um, for, for that symposium. Um, and Patty, um, maybe if you wanna share the project at that point that you kind of talked about at the symposium um, during your, your keynote that um, really then, then kind of, um, yeah. Yeah, so I think like probably part of the reason that I was invited um, was because I, at the time I was working on this scene called We're So Not Getting the Security Deposit Back, A Guide to Defunct Artist Spaces. So this was sort of the start of it. Now I had um, started this on the blog maybe about a year and a half ago, two years before um, before this project, before I was invited. So this might've been like 2015, 2016. And one of the reasons that this project sort of came into being was that um, I was constantly flown to different places uh, in the United States and introduced to different artist run spaces that nobody knew of. You know, I, I would come back and maybe the, the places would look different or they wouldn't exist at all. And I was just like, what can we do about these places? And this also was like at the height of sort of New York gentrification story. So I was also deeply involved in like trying to figure out ways that I could still have an apartment, you know? And so, um, yeah, I think maybe almost rather than deal with that quite directly, I was like, well, let's take a look at um, where all of these really talented artists are, what they're doing and what um, this, like, what this looked like, what this is really looking like across the country. So we did a pilot edition um, which was the, so we're so not getting the security de deposit back with Washington DC. And we worked with them um, almost randomly. You know, there was somebody who contacted me, was like, I really wanna do this. And we're like, okay. and I was like, okay, well, we'll help support the publication. Um, at that point, I was really winding the blog down, but this was a project that I felt incredibly passionate about. So we basically made this scene, it's about 40 pages filled with, honestly, just incredible stories, um, different types of artist run spaces, ones that started in the 1970s um, that like uh, lasted 40 years and went through like 500 different iterations. Um, different, uh, there were also um, different spaces that, that ran for very short periods of time. Maybe they ran out of a garage all of this was recorded and then we did a series with um i i think american university we, we did a series of talks that sort of um connected 
with the work that we had done. And that's how the first pilot project came into being. And I think when I went to um, Champaign, Illinois, that was what I spent a good amount of time talking about. And maybe two months later, because I was talking about this, but I really had no plan, um, Corey and Dulcie phoned me up and they were like, you know, this just seems like such a great project. And we had an amazing time, you know, like this seems like such a great project, uh, but like, doesn't it seem like a lot to do with like just you? Would you like some partners? And I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> yes. And there was the start of Impractical Spaces. And we spent two years literally just working on the, on figuring out a structure that would make this project executable. Yeah, thank you. That's a lot of boring stuff, but so. <laughs> no, it's not boring at all. It actually, um, it leads into this like great question because there's such like a wide breadth of what an artist run space like really is um, and how you can define that for the purposes of creating an archive or creating um, kind of this like storage container for all of that information. Um, so what I'm really curious, I kind of think of it as like this ambiance or idea, like not directly tied to any kind of physical space, um, but like a group of artists collaborating or a single artist looking to educate or expand. But I'm so curious to see kind of how the three of you as in practical spaces and maybe like separately are thinking about the definition of an audience run or of an artist run space. I think that's a great question. And I think it's something that we talk a lot about, um, the three of us, and we've kind of gone back and forth. Um, I've started to try to use the term artist run initiative because I actually think um, space really limits it. Like um, an artist run space could be a gallery that's started by artists, but it could also be a publication that a group of artists are making. Um, and so I think it comes down to intention um, like, why is the space there uh, or the, the project? Like, what is the intention behind it? And oftentimes, you know, these are really experimental, short-term um, projects that don't usually, they're not usually started with a goal of um, making money <laughs> sometimes. Um, but there's also like a million different artist run spaces and a million different ways of doing it. So it's really hard to come up with one definition because whenever you start to try to put parameters or to define it, there's always um, artist led initiatives or projects that um, don't fall into that, but still might be considered um, part of that. So something that we've decided, so with this project, with our hope, our kind of grand dream, um, is to document um, at least 50 cities in 50 different states across the country. And we realized this is going to be a super long-term project. Um, but I think with that, working with each community or each city to really establish what does artist run mean in their community and really having these um, publications be site specific to the location. And that's something that we've been um, really conscious of. And we wanna make sure that, um, that the communities and the people that are working with us, um, our partners in these communities are a part of helping us define that. <laughs> I think that's really interesting because I think that that's also something that I've um, realized through my research is that maybe the models that we have here in Philly, which are really membership oriented kind of models of artist run spaces specifically are different than maybe other places where it's not that same model. So I think that's really interesting the way that it is based on a, a city approach and seeing that there's different approaches in different places. So yeah, and also speaks to what Dulcie was talking about earlier with um, kind of the like the density of mm -hmm. um, artist run action or artist run initiatives um, in cities. There just are so many more that can be so much more targeted to um, certain sect of art or a type of art or a certain type of interaction with the public. Um, whereas kind of farther from like city um, metropolitan centers, you get this kind of uh, more all encompassing 
type of artist runs um, spaces, actions, initiatives, whatever, yeah. whatever you want to say. Um, I often find myself using the term projects because it's it's all sorts of projects or initiatives. It's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I will say that we do see themes evolve, um, particularly um, at the beginning. There, there tends to be um, certain things like um, a willingness or um, interest in doing things before um, you know planning things out completely. So that's something that we see quite frequently. I think, Corey, when you organize the um, Impractical Spaces event in Kansas City, I think almost everybody who started a space had a very specific story that did not include a business plan. You know, well, there's one person who had a business plan, but he went to a library to find out how to write one, and it was like completely made up. So. Yeah, no, it's definitely, I mean, it's interesting to see kind of how that works out because it's as much as it is about kind of the artist starting the work, it's about what the work will be in the future. Um, so kind of like that driving passion for change you want to see or projects you want to see accomplished in certain communities. Um, yeah, and I... I think about the project that Dulcie mentioned earlier. So Dulcie and I went to grad school together in central Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And um, Dulcie had come, well, I think during your time in uh, grad school, you were also working at Oxbow, but we mm -hmm. had both come from histories of, of working um, around and in artist-run projects. And so coming to grad school, we were both kind of out of our element and we're in the middle of Illinois and we're like, what's going on? Like, what are the artist run projects? And they're like Dulcie said, there were a lot scattered all across the state. They just weren't in Champaign-Urbana when we were. And so really like our intention for starting Say Uncle, which is this nomadic um, like exhibition residency program was really to connect um, with artists and to connect with the other um, artists that were running initiatives across the state that were sometimes like one or two hours away. So with our artist run project, we never had a space. It was just kind of like work popped up where it made sense um, with whatever artist that was in residence. And, um, and then we would travel their work to the other artist run spaces that were within like a two hour radius of where we lived and kind of put put up the work outside of the gallery shows that were opening so it was a really like collaborative process with the artist and um it it was really unique and experimental so the artists that worked with us really had to be uh open to some different different things yeah i, I was thinking of a couple of things it related to kind of what you're saying corey i think as far as like the way that that project um, kind of fit a, a particular need, like the, the way you're describing, like it was in a, in a way an excuse for us to kind of be, get to know folks and connect with different folks. And I think going back to the, your kind of original question that started, um, I think as far as artists run spaces and like defining some of those characteristics, one that comes to my mind um, and I think relates to what, what Corey's bringing up with that, that project that we did um, is just the, the project's ability to um, respond to like very quickly to changing needs or um, changing circumstances be that, um, okay, well, we no longer have a, you know, a space <laughs> or we no longer have um, you know, a certain resource, but also particular needs that are specific to wherever that project is located or, or specific to the folks who are running that project too. Um, because often, as Patty was saying, um, those consistencies, one is, is definitely changed in terms of who's, um, you know, who's kind of facilitating running um, different projects and the changes that, of course, happen in those folks' lives. So I think um, as far as one of those core characteristics, that's something that I see um, is that, um, that ability for projects to, to shift to meet particular needs or changes. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Um, in your process of like archiving or just like kind of research at this point, have you noticed like um, 
if there was like a trend um, or I don't even know if, if there's data that would support this, but kind of like original intent or original project goals versus like what actually happened after starting or collaborating with the community partners or kind of with other folks that are involved. Um, if you saw any any similar trends in that, but yeah, again, that maybe is not <laughs> something that is so easily measured. Well, I, I don't know about trends per se, but one thing that we um, that we have done with um, uh, a number of projects is uh, there's sort of an information box that we have with all of them. So there's a questionnaire that people can use or not use. It's up to them, but most of the time we um, people use it at least to some degree. Um, that asks sort of basic questions about how the place gets started. But the information box gives you um, information, like just the basic information, like who is the person telling the narrative? When was the organization formed? And importantly, and to your question, um, what, what form, like what was the evolution of its form? And so in some cases, the evolution of the form was consistent. It began as a, maybe a nonprofit initiative and stayed that way. In very many cases, there, were, there was a lot of evolution, right? Um, and uh, the, the members who were part of, part of it initially um, maybe are no longer parts or participants. And that even comes up like a, a lot of these sort of there is some basic taxonomy um, when you start talking about the types of uh, artist run spaces and um, sort of how they break down structurally because there's really only so many ways that a um, um, business, even if it's not designed to make any money or like a project, let's call it like a project can really run. Um, and so you do see those things. I would hesitate to call them um, trends so much is just, um, just they really are taxonomies. I think one thing that we see in terms of the, the thing that I always think about when I think about like certain types of projects that, um, that represent a thematic thread um, is that both, I think in almost all the projects that we have at like different cities we, we've um, with the partners that we have there's always a space that is both a music venue and um, an art space and those are the ones that tend to have like the craziest stories those are the ones like we and in dc there's like there was a place called hard art that had um a concert with it was an impromptu pro concert with the bad brains in this space that was like, I don't know, the size of a closet and they fit a hundred people in there. And it was disgusting. It was the middle of summer. And they talked about how when they came back, there was just this like sweat ring around the room because there were so many people packed into that space. But then in Kansas City, they talked about, Corey, do you remember the name of that venue? The um, where they talked, to, um, they gave a presentation about um, all the different like superstars they managed to bring into the venue. And like, the, it was like a virtual who's who of like 90s uh, rap stars. Yeah, I think that space was Locus Solus. Um, that space was maybe like 20 years ago. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it, it was really interesting hearing that history and how like the music paired with the art. Um, I would say we hear that a lot. There's a there's a space here in Grand Rapids um, that I I also don't necessarily wouldn't I wouldn't call this a trend, but it is something that we've noticed too. Um, and the space in Grand Rapids is an example of what you're what you're saying, Patty. The music is an all all ages um, music venue called the Division Avenue for the Arts um, Council, and it was a collectively run organization that was around I think for a little over ten years on South Division in Grand Rapids. Um, and then kind of went dormant for a time and is now back with a new, completely kind of new group of folks running it. 
Um, and it, so it was music and art and several different kinds of um, community activities happened there too. Um, but it was like kind of foundationally around music and art specifically. But I, I do think that we've seen that um, in several different places where there are those, those spaces that um, it's kind of to me, I mean, this might be cheesy, but um, it's kind of like the folks couldn't, couldn't quite let them go. Um, and so they, they have come back in some different form. Um, with maybe that different organization that you're mentioning, Patty, or some, um, in this case, a, a different group of folks who, who wanted to continue on that work. Um, so that is something that we've seen too. Um, and I, I would guess, of course, other folks here have, have you know, have seen that, that kind of um, wave to spaces. You know, one of the things that I think is like most interesting um, about learning uh, about these different spaces can be the, the degree to which cities really shape the art um, and different spaces. And that's, I think that is something that is more significant than I maybe realized. So Dulcie, maybe you can talk about this a little bit, but I mean, I always knew, I mean, if you were sort of following um, Art Prize and like what mm -hmm. that is, you probably know that it's a giant, um, a public prize where people have to vote on art that looks like praying mantises and like um, all sorts of terrible things and sometimes they have some good stuff but it's like it brings in tons of people and has really shaped the city um, and I feel like that got um, borne out a little bit in some of the work that that you've done. Yeah. Yeah, that that um, that competition, that program, our prize, um, really, really has shifted um, from my understanding of, of being out of Grand Rapids and then kind of coming back um, into Grand Rapids. That, that that project really shifted all kinds of things structurally in the city. Um, largely, that idea of of funding. Um, there used to be an arts council, um, and that that kind of allocated funding. Um, and and with Art Prize the the funding structures sh shifted um, but also i think in a, a really big way um there's also just um re real estate is is nuts here i mean it's completely completely um really really high priced um and so that i think is one of those things kind of getting into that that idea of like urban urban planning urban development and, and kind of um combining i think what you're saying patty in terms of the way that that imp like like impacts the art um which of course um are kind of holding hands in this example where there's not there's not quite as as much um, available space for these projects uh, maybe available funding um, available time in some ways i think too and also available attention um, from from various publics because there's a really really intensive seasonal attention um, that that happened has happened for art prize um, and now I, i'm not sure what's going to happen as things shift um, over the last the last couple of years really with that um, but I, I do think that it's a fascinating example of the way that that, um, that kind of, like that program really just intersected in the way that I think you're, you're talking about, Patty. Yeah, Yeah, I did see that they're coming yeah. back, um, but apparently without a, an exhibitions director, so that should be interesting. Yeah, um, I, I really, I really haven't heard, haven't heard what the structure of that's going to be. I'm curious how that um, yeah, how that might shift things again in, a, in maybe a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, in Houston too, there, um, I think there's specific ways that Houston is zoned that, um, sort of allows, uh, pop-ups to crop up pretty much wherever. Um, so you can have like a really, uh, you can have artists run spaces in very unusual places where they wouldn't normally, um, in other cities where the zoning is, is a little bit more, um, is works a little differently um like houston scene is really sort of unique in that way so we were actually fairly close on um wrapping up that book um so that should be pretty exciting and that's that's run by um pete uh gershon and he's just he's an incredible an incredible yeah. historian I think it's interesting also uh, going back to sort of the conversation about music spaces and art spaces and how they're often in the same place. I've noticed in Philly a lot, it's, it's often different places. Um, and I came to my research about DIY sort of art spaces from a background in DIY punk music spaces. 
but I've noticed that they're often different um, and in different locations because of what seems like a lot of zoning issues. So there were in the past spaces that were together um, and showed art and had music, but a lot of times those places were shut down because of zoning rules. So I think that that's also interesting with, with the points you touched on that, you know, in other cities that can't really happen so much because of rules about hosting events in certain spaces and not being able to be up to code with that. So, you know, in here in Philly, it's, it's a big issue that you can't kind of have those spaces the same way and that just fire codes and event spaces, it's a little different. I mean, I think one of the um, interesting things about the project that, um, that I think makes it a little like fairly unique too is that um, I think with a normal publication project, there is almost a sort of random like, okay, we will work within X date and X date um, and these will be the parameters. Um, that didn't make sense for us because uh, we like to let um, let our city partners decide what they're going to choose because they are the ones who have the expertise so they're going to be able to tell us whether realistically like how far they can go back so with kansas city i mean we go back more than 100 years i think with with um, that history which is just so incredible um, to read, but then we have other histories like the DC um, history that we we produced that begins in 1970. Um, and we have, I think with Puerto Rico, which we're also working with, they're gonna begin, I believe in 1980. So they all start at different times, um, but we do have a few overlapping decades. You know, there's nobody who has said to us, I'd like to exclude the last 10 years. So <laughs> we do have, we do have the contemporary. And that like, that just like, that seems so exciting to me when I think about the, that overlap between all those places that you mentioned, Patty, that are all going to have that information sheet where you can, you can go see what was going on in Kansas City. Meanwhile, you know, this was going on in, in DC and they're actually like, pretty much the same, <laughs> the same kind of space, or maybe are running into similar kind of problems or had similar trajectories like that, like revealing that that history is happening. Um, that's when I, I get super excited um, to, to reveal that that, that is, is part of um, this kind of history that we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's super interesting because mm -hmm. yeah, it points to like greater kind of collaboration and like mm -hmm. system engagement that you don't really, yeah, overtly see until you do this kind of like picking of places and, and doing that sort of like in-depth um, kind of like history of a place, I guess. Um, what is, oh, I was just gonna say like, it's so, once a, an artist run space or project closes, really it disappears so quickly from people's minds and from the history. So I think, even just the research that we've done in Kansas City, I know Patty said we're going back 100 years, uh, we found um, that there was one corner, uh, one particular intersection that over the past 100 years, like multiple artist run spaces have inhabited the same storefront. And it was like, that knowledge is out there in our um, art community and in our community in general, but like it's never been written down, it's never been documented. And so um, to just be able to say that and then have this um, publication and this resource documenting all of that is, uh, it's, it's really amazing. Yeah, you know, I feel like those types of records tend to exist, you know, if a, if a restaurant um, if a series of different restaurants occupy a space, you, it's much more likely that there would be a history of that, in part because those businesses have incorporated it and there's like a, more of a paper trail around them. A lot of times we don't have that. And so we have to rely on an oral history or, um, you know, different types of histories to unearth this information. And it's really um, sort of significant that we're able to do that because I, you know, the art, the artist community is, I think, 
maybe tighter knit than I even realized. Because um, I think there's a lot of communities. If you've got a bunch of accountants together and said, hey, let's do a history, they'd be like, see you later. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like. Right, absolutely. Um, we have a question here um, from Julie, who is asking how the cities are selected, um, and especially paying attention to how groups are underrepresented in the historical record, uh, and how history is subjective. Yeah, well, you know, that is a, uh, <laughs> so this project, let's see, we've been working on it for almost two years as the group of three of us and the ways that we've come up like with executing it, we've probably had 20 different versions of how Impractical Spaces is going to work or how we choose partners or how cities get involved or what the, how long the project will last. Um, and then, you know, with COVID, it's caused us to rethink everything again. And so the, the question of, you know, how we choose our cities and how we choose our partners, um, you know, I think we're still, right now, we're trying to finish our first six partners, which are, let's see, Puerto Rico, Houston, Portland, Oregon. Uh, we're going to republish Baltimore. Is that right? Kansas City? D.C. 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 Kansas City, and then there's one more that I'm in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids, thank yeah. you. Sorry, Dulcie, you're sitting right there. Yeah. Um, so I think, but you know, we've been asking ourselves that question, like what, how do we decide on our cities? And and then when we do, like, how do we pick our partners? Because this, uh, it's a lot of work. You know, we're relying a lot on our partners and we talk about how impractical spaces as a whole is it really like an artist run initiative or an artist run project like we're not we are a um, nonprofit organization but that doesn't mean that we're any of us are making money off of this this is all a project that we're donating our time to so um when we're inviting people to be partners or when they're saying they want to be partners um we want to make sure they understand the time commitment and um, just how big of um, a lot of it's a volunteer job. So uh, I think it gets really, uh, it gets hard to say, you know, come up with really strict parameters around how we select partners and how we do it. Cause it's, um, it's not like anyone's getting paid for this work, at least not right now, hopefully in the future, we can get our partners paid. Right, absolutely. So it's a question that we're, we're thinking a lot about and just like artist run spaces in general require a lot of free time and a lot of free labor. And um, you know, who has the time and the money to do that? Um, and so I think there's a lot, of, a lot of questions that we're asking ourselves through this process. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. You. And then we have a, a follow up to that from Daniel. Um, and it was a follow up to both Claire's question about tracking changes in mission statements and Julie's question. And he asks, um, any thoughts about how changes in recent years from spaces that may either be loosely apolitical or focus on a value, sy value system of experimentation who have now switched to be um, more explicitly oriented around social justice? How could that be tracked and would that be useful? You know, I, um, it's something that I think with Houston, we have not um, been tracking that. Um, and it's something that we, we might uh, start to revisit. One thing though, um, that I have noticed with uh, certain artist run spaces. So um, let's take like um, Tiger Strikes Asteroid as an example. They have many chapters. And I think that they, um, at least originally seemed to um, see to be loosely apolitical. And one of the things um, that Alex Pegg told me um, when I was talking to him maybe six months ago was that they had taken this time to really kind of um, think about their internal identity um, and what that, um, like what that meant. Um, and they felt that they had always described themselves as an alternative and then wondered, well, what, what are we an alternative to? And a lot of the um, protests over the summer and 
a lot of the things that have come out about various board members at museums that are all kind of gross and icky and like all of that, it became very clear to them that they could run an organization that was not compromised in that way. And that that was part of what their identity was. And I would like to think that that is um, partially what, where I think some of this is going, that they're like what we see artists' faces being an alternative to now um, is a system um, of wealth that we see as broken. Um, and that baked within that is um, racial inequity, structural, like economic inequity, all of those things. Yeah, no, that's, thank you. That's a really like, very clear cut answer. Um, I also think that, that it might have some interesting ties to like um, kind of the rejection of having like a physical permanent space um, in some cases, if like trying to create like, uh, trying to create a new version of, of the system that has been like failing in so many ways. Um, if part of that is saying to like, well, we're just won't be involved with the real estate <laughs> business or we won't be involved with trying to like incorporate or do any of like, like the more legal aspects of like becoming a, you know, like long standing kind of addition to a community. Um, I think that question of um, what are we an alternative to is really interesting. And that's something um, that Dulcie and I actually talked a lot about when we were coming up with Beyond Alternatives, um, which I think is actually one night of frustration how we how we got to that title is that all these, you know, that idea of an alternative gets thrown around a lot, but really alternatives are all doing like as we talked about earlier, we can classify these spaces. There's the co-op model. There's the, um, we're gonna sell work that pays for our space model. There's like the um, people that run it pay in model. So there's like, you know, a few distinct models that are all alternatives, but really, um, you know, they're not alternatives anymore. Maybe at one point they were, but now um, th they're, they're all, you know, done slightly different, but there's definitely a model there. Uh, so I think that's interesting. Creating a new vision, um, a new form. It's very interesting. Oh, and the other thing I was going to say in Kansas City, so what you were talking about, Claire, of spaces, um, maybe just saying, I'm not going to deal with this system. Um, we've actually seen that happen with a few of the spaces in Kansas City, and they went from having um, a storefront where they were doing a really active program. Maybe they had openings every month. They were doing artist talk series to being, um, to just existing on an Instagram account. Um, not that Instagram is a lot better than the real estate market, but, um, and they're totally shifting the way that they, um, what their goals are as a space and how they, um, participate in, um, the art community in Kansas City and nationally. And it's really interesting um, to just see how COVID is changing Kansas City and its artist run um, and artist community. Uh, I think we're gonna look a lot different uh, in a year. I still don't, it's still foggy to me what's going on, but I know there's a lot of change and I know a lot of the spaces are going virtual. Yeah, I'll be so interested to see how that kind of all, how that all plays out. Um, we do want to reiterate, if anyone has any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, we're super excited to answer anything. Um, and I do, I, I think this like kind of, this question about how you can like maintain a presence in a place without being a physical like spot to go to like how you remain connected and engaged and like really talking directly with the community that you're in um, which I those are all kind of like highlights of what I define an artist run initiative to be so I think it's really coming to the forefront here now that 
what people are seeing that you can do this sort of work virtually. Um, and then also maybe you should be doing it virtually for all of these kinds of more theoretical reasons, in addition to just like ease of convenience. Um, yeah, that's, that is very interesting. Do you, do you suspect that the models will change um, a lot in the next like, I don't know, like two to five years, like you were talking about the co-op model or like all, all of these kinds of like different forms that you're, you've been seeing. Um, do you think COVID will have like a major impact on those structures or just kind of the, um, the like actual space or not space that they're in? I guess for me, um, and sorry to cut you off, Dulcie, but I, I can go next. I go back to how artists are going to come out of this pandemic because the spaces do require uh, you to have um, extra time and extra income, um, whether or not these spaces require a lot of money. A lot of them are really just like done on shoestring budgets. They might not even call it a budget, but it costs money and it costs time. And I think if artists um, come out of the pandemic, I mean, it's all individual situations, but if um, if there is still the time and the money, then I think some of these spaces will start. I think we're gonna see really different, I think we're gonna see really different models because I think people's priorities have changed. Um, speaking with a lot of artists who um, show work in galleries, a lot of, um, people, a lot of my friends that I've spoken with are questioning whether they're interested in even showing their work anymore or why they were showing it before and what their intentions and their goals as an artist are. So I think, um, you know, I think we're gonna see some different things as people are, um, their priorities are shifting and um, their intentions and the reasons they're making work are becoming more clear. I was gonna, which is interesting after kind of hearing you share that, Corey, what I was going to say, um, because in, in Grand Rapids, where I'm located in Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, through the, the last year, there have actually been several older folks who have actually started spaces in, at their homes, um, in their, in their garages, um, and then one, one person in a, like a little, um, kind of the front part of her home anyway, and I, I think that, that that can seem a little bit different than um, some, of the, some of the spaces that we've talked about and some of the spaces that I think about as far as the research that, that I've done here, which are um, started by um, you know, maybe some, some of those same folks, but, but 30 years earlier. Um, and so I think there's, there's something, I mean, it's not, it's not a direct answer to the question in terms of like, what is this going to look like or, or kind of speculating what's going to happen. But that is something that I've noticed in three, three new spaces is, is very significant here. <laughs> um, that might not seem like in a, in a larger place that that, that might be um, so much to add into the, the mix of what's going on, but three spaces is really significant. And um, the, the particular artist that they're showing as well. Um, I think that, that that is, is a shift and it's a shift that they are not a storefront. They're people who have, um, they have the space, they have, like you're saying, Corey, um, that additional, you know, that time they have, they have the space to do this, they have resources. And so, um, they're, they're thinking about how to restructure what they do have to make these things kind of happen, um, for, um, for artists run projects, artists run spaces, and ultimately artists themselves. So, um, yeah, that's, that's something that came to mind as a response to your question. I do think that a lot of what you, uh, you, you both have said about, um, like the online space becoming, um, more significant to artists will sort of, that trend will continue. I think one of the things that's fairly significant has been the mainstreaming of various subscription, um, models and software that easily collects that money. So when things like, when those types of shifts take place um, culturally, then they are bound to affect uh, artist run spaces as well. I mean, you're just not going to see artists operating completely separate from the rest of the culture. If we are all got a subscription to everything, 
we're going to get one to artist run spaces too. Looks like we have another question. Yes, we do. Um, a question from Stephanie, uh, who was asking that in the context of places that are tracking histories um, that are underrepresented, such as the One Archives or the Stonewall National Museum and Archives, do you see a pathway to house or locate permanently a living archive for National Registry for Artist Spaces in the US? Um, giving the example of Common Fields phone book, um, even just kind of speaking to what the archive would look like and if it's possible. I, I guess, you know, we've kind of talked about that as a group. I've definitely talked about it with a few um, institutions in Kansas City that are interested in housing just the Kansas City archive. Um, I, I think as a national project, we're still watching this thing take shape. Like we've definitely have goals for it, like long-term goals, like 10, 15 years out, you know, it's like, wouldn't it be great if like we had this, um, so many cities that we could really have like um, uh, a history of artist run spaces in the United States. And, um, but I think it's really, you know, the project is gonna unfold and because there's, it's so collaborative and we have so many partners, we can envision what we think it's gonna look like, but we don't really know <laughs> until it happens. And so um, I, I definitely think it would be awesome to have a living archive. Um, I don't know where it would make sense to house it or um, how you know any of that could work. But I think um, you know once we start gathering this research, um, it would be a good thing. I know in Kansas City there, um, there's a museum, the Kansas City Museum, and they're interested in housing it. And um, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art is interested in housing something like this. And then one of our um, large nonprofits, the Charlotte Street Foundation. So it's like, it potentially could live in three different places just in Kansas City. So I think if there's this much demand just in this one place, I'm sure um, once we have multiple cities, it could be. And I don't know, I really, I really like that question because I, I kind of wonder, um, and I, I kind of wonder about like that idea that there is one place to go for this information. Um, to me, there seems something really rich about having to go to Kansas City, which of course there's issues of access and there's, there's all kinds of, <laughs> there's all kinds of things wrapped up in that in terms of politics. Um, but I do think there is something um, interesting to me about there not being kind of one place where the information that archive would be stored, where it would be other places situated in the places where that came, that the information kind of came from, where that history is embedded. And so, um, yeah, I, I really, I really appreciate that question because I think it speaks to um, so many of those systems, um, which we were just kind of talking about, of course, too. Um, yeah, that's just, that's a thought. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And then we are gonna end on this last question from Anna. Um, she said that she's stuck on this phrase of, you know, it's not like anyone is making any money doing this. Um, so what are the motivations for dedicating time and money to these places? And where's the power in being artist run? What a lovely I think, question to end on. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, one, of, one of the, to answer that second or respond rather to that second bit, what, where is the power in being artist run? Um, I think oftentimes artist run spaces, projects, platforms, initiatives, whatever we want to call them, um, that they're often the places that are willing to take risks with artists and show folks that, that don't necessarily, um, in terms of galleries or museums that are much larger scale, um, that don't necessarily have access um, to those particular places. So I think that artists run places, projects um, can be really, really, really um, essential for, for artists to understand their own work, to be in community with other people, um, they're huge for artists. And I think that that is powerful. I think fundamentally you, uh, um, you have to value learning 
you know, because so much of what this work is, is about that. And if you find value and power in learning, which I think we, we would, we all do here, like that is where a lot of that power comes from. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, and I think about my own um, history with artist-run spaces and just how strong of a community. So it may not have, um, I may not walk away with like money in my pocket because I've participated in these projects, but as an artist walking away with um, collaborators such as Dulcie and Patty and having these lifelong relationships that are constantly influencing my work as well as experiences that have taught me so much about um, my own art career, as well as learning about um, the art careers of, um, you know, hundreds of artists across the United States. Uh, it's, there's just no other way to get that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you so, so much, so much yeah. um, for talking with us today. Uh, Patty, Corey, and Dulcie really just added like, there's so much to think about, I think, when it comes to artist-run spaces um, and how they're existing in the U.S. and why it's important to pay attention to them um, while they are existing before a new one crops up in its place. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And please, um, we'll drop, uh, Megan and I will drop our emails mm -hmm. in the chat here. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you.